item of business is a member's business debate on motion 17050 in the name of Claire Adamson on Child Safety Week 2019. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Claire Adamson to open the debate. Ms Adamson, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I thank those members who have signed the Child Safety Week motion and all of those who will take part in the debate this evening? Child Safety Week is the flagship annual campaign led by the Child Accident Prevention Trust, CAPT, and it runs from the 3rd to the 9th of June with a theme this year of A Family Life Today. Presiding Officer, accidents remain the main cause of death in Scotland for children and young babies. Two out of five child deaths are from unintentional injury and 7,260 children were admitted to hospital following accidental injury, some of whom will have experienced life-changing injuries. But this is just the tip of the iceberg because that's hospital admissions. It doesn't record the presentations at e e from accidents that could result in breaks, of bones or um, burns or scalds or um, any of these um, sort of lesser um, injuries that nonetheless are very traumatic for the young children involved. I would like to highlight a change in circumstance since I last debated safety in the chamber. The Scottish Government has committed to embedding the UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, into Scots law and all aspects of Scottish life. This is particularly important because we know from the statistics that disadvantaged groups and those from SIMD areas of deprivation are far more likely to be the victims of accidents and unintentional injuries. Article 24 of the Convention states that to ensure all segments of society in particular, parents and children are informed, have access to education and are supported in the use of basic knowledge in a number of areas, but including the prevention of accidents. So I must apologise to the Minister in advance that um, I'm likely to be um, bringing this to the Chamber um, frequently over the coming years to ensuring that accident prevention makes it to the top of the political agenda. And this is very important because we do have a statutory duty on road safety in Scotland, but there isn't a statutory duty for safety in the home, for instance. And we know that um, pressures on councils have led to a lot of home safety positions being incorporated into other roles such as trading standards within the councils. And it's something that we must be very vigilant about. Can I mention the partners that are involved in this year's um, uh, Child Safety Week? Um, Safer Scotland from the Scottish Government, Think the Road Safety Information for Road Users, um, Bitrex, who um, produced the bitterest substance ever discovered. Um, and I don't know if the minister has yet to take a Bitrex test, but I'm sure she won't have forgotten it as she, as she has. Um, and also Thomas Cook's um, children's charity, who are committed to improving lives and benefiting communities uh, in, in the UK. If I could just turn to some of the dangers that are involved uh, in this, and it's something that I do really recommend people look at the CAPT Twitter feed and at their website, which contains really useful information about the potential dangers to young people and children, but also gives um, really good advice to parents about how they can avoid unintentional injuries. And burns and skull can be um, from uh, the, the use of hair straighteners, um, which we know um, can, especially in a young child, um, because it's a grab injury, um, that can restrict their movement in, in, um, as, as they grow older and, and restrict their, their hand movements. And having a lifelong change to um, the outcome for that young people. We also know that um, the hot drinks and, and hot bath water is also an area that we have to be very vigilant about. Um, we also know that one of the most frightening things for a parent to experience is stopping breathing. And this is an area, again, that um, a, a change in the way that we, we live has, has, has brought new dangers in that area. 
Um, we know that blind cords have um, a particular danger for, for young toddlers, and that, um, that's a campaign that's been running for a long number of, in, uh, of years now. But we've also very tragically seen recently um, babies and young children being um, suffocated from nappy sacks. Uh, and so there's lots of advice about storage, safe storage of nappy stacks away from cots, away from play areas, um, because that um, is another potential danger for young people. We also know um, that poisoning is also a worry for parents. And uh, in my day, it was we had a, a, a cupboard that was kept all the bleaches and chemicals in it, and we were told not to put them into bottles that weren't that looked like drinks and all these kind of things. And I remember those messages at that time. But of course, time and technology moves on and we now have a, a risk from liquid tabs, which are very common in uh, households used in dishwashers and in um, our laundry. And I have to say, a lot of the manufacturers have um, taken cognizance of the work that not only the Cross-Party Group and Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness has done, but the other organisations involved in this area and have moved away from um, some of the um, prettier colours and the more, more scented um, liquid tabs to make them uh, less appealing to young children, and, that, and that's to be welcomed. Um, but also, um, a, Button batteries have become very common in very many um, electrical items that can be bought. Um, a lot of them in toys that are um, presented um, for use for children and toddlers. And, and they pose a particular hazard, not only because they can be swallowed very easily by a young child, um, but that can have a devastating impact and actually be fatal in some circumstances. So it's something we need to alert parents to those possible dangers. We also know that falls um, from, um, from cots, from high chairs, um, for, uh, just in and around the house, uh, dangers from falls um, can have a serious impact on young people and we should be looking to um, prevent those wherever possible. Um, road safety as well, and um, members may know that I have a particular interest in this area having had a a tragedy in my own family regarding road safety and um, I have to say that um, it, it was that that brought me to this, this area. I'm not a practitioner in safety at all but it's something that I, I feel in, in the position I had as a councillor and also as an MSP that I, I should be promoting and um, I'm, I'm not the only person who's taken that positive from a family tragedy um, in if we look to the particular area of drowning where there's been a lot of work done in Scotland we now have a Scottish drowning pre prevention strategy that came from the work of the um, members of the cross-party group um, but I'd like to, to pay particular um, credit to the Spears family in Glasgow um, Duncan and Margaret lost their son when he was in a night out in Glasgow and was drowned in the Clyde and they have been campaigning tirelessly to have um, the, the signage improved along the Clyde walkways and also to have ropes attached to um, the life um, uh, providers that are, are there on, on the quayside. And um, it, it's really, um, I have to pay tribute not to the Spears but to any family who have come forward and become the face of a safety message because it does mean much more to the public and puts a, a, a face to what, what is, um, can be seen as quite a dry and um, technical um, advice area, but when you put um, the human aspect in there and we've had families come forward to, to show the effect of um, burns on their children, we've had um, people come forward to warn about carbon monoxide poisoning who have been affected by that. And it really does, um, uh, I really have to pay tribute to the bravery of those families who um, are willing to come forward and, and try to prevent that happening to anyone else. Of course, fire safety and carbon monoxide poisoning are, are two of the areas that we worry about in our, our families. And we know that there's much um, more frequent use of electrical equipment, but we also have um, cheaper versions of equipment um, uh, and chargers being used that, that can pose a danger. And I pay tribute to the work of the electrical safety um, electrical safety first in um, advising consumers about um, ethical purchasing and also warning of the dangers along with our trading standards officers who work in this area. Um, later this evening, President Officer, I'll be um, convening the Cross-Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness. We now have over 140 members, um, all of whom are dedicated to making 
our lives, our working and our leisure lives as safe as possible. And we have said we want Scotland to be the best place in the world to grow up. And that means that we want Scotland to be the safest place in the world to grow up. So I commend the motion to the Chamber and thank you to the members who will be taking part. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask uh, the public in the gallery, because I know why you want to clap, but it's not permitted uh, uh, applause in the public area. Uh, speeches of four minutes, please. Uh, Gillian Martin, followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank Claire Adamson, not just for securing this debate, but for the huge amount of work that she does on safety issues. Being safe is all about assessing risk and taking steps to minimise that risk. And you can only do that through discussion and education. And I thank her for all she does to facilitate that. Family life's always been a changing situation. The other day I was speaking to a constituent at a sports club and it turned out that he'd been a fireman in the 1970s in Clyde Bank. My mother and father had their three small children a fat in Faithley, or the Faithley as it's known, in the 1970s before we moved to Aberdeenshire. And uh, I was recalling the day that we had a chip pan fire and I was joking with him that maybe he had attended that and he said, well, I think every Clyde Bank family in the 1970s had a chip pan fire at one time or another. I'll have been to thousands. And that high risk is largely gone. We don't really use open chip pans anymore. Electrical safety has improved and the home's in an altogether safer place. But as technology improves, the old, the old dangers are replaced with new ones. And helping children understand what to do to avoid harm and deal with accidents and emergencies can never start too young. And I want to commend the work done in schools in my constituency by the Dinky Doctors. I had a wonderful morning with the nursery children at Mintlaw Primary who were treated to a fun interactive hour where they learned how to call for an ambulance, what to do, for example, if they got burned or any of their family needed help. The dinky doctors embed accident prevention and response into short sessions that go right up to primary seven and are age appropriate every step of the way. So for the nursery kids, Teddy's the patient and the kids would know what to do if Teddy fell and he wasn't answering. And in the later stages of school, the dinky doctors will be teaching things, more complex things like CPR and other emergency response methods to young people. So avoidance of accidents in the home environment is key to a child's safety. But so many accidents still happen in the home as wood burning stoves and open fires have become more fashionable. The dangers that we thought we'd eradicated with the affordability of central heating and having radiators rather than open fires are kind of coming back. As fashions change and we have hair straighteners with high temperature ceramic plates being used every day in the home, we increase the chance of really severe burns. And I thank the Child Accident Prevention Trust for the excellent action pack that they've developed, which looks at ways how to prevent accidents in, in a modern home. And I'm going to put a link to that on my social media. It's exactly the sort of resource that will help families and community groups and organisations make meaningful safety changes in homes across the country that can keep those that are most precious to us safe from harm. But what of the future? Um, we have a climate emergency and families will be encouraged to leave their cars at home as they do the school run, which is only right, something which I, I welcome. But that means that our streets are going to have to get a lot safer. Safe routes to school are built into the requirements um, as we, um, in every local authority. And colleagues will know that I'm a cyclist, a, a nervous cyclist. I want safe cycle routes to school to be a requirement as we tackle the twin challenges of childhood obesity and climate change. And I think that children should have the right to cycle on a path that is free from cars. And I think parents should also have the peace of mind to allow their children the freedom to get to school under their own steam, by foot or by bike. And right now, cycling to school for too many is just far too dangerous. And we know that a quarter of all cyclist deaths uh, are uh, children. We need infrastructure change starting now other EU countries have made a conscious decision to change their streets to encourage cycling and prevent accidents. Lives have been saved, health and well-being has been improved and families have peace of mind. Um, we can do what we can through education and make our homes safer, but safety on our streets needs decisive action to give children the right of a safe cycle route. Presiding officer. Thank you very much.
I call Alison Harris, who will be followed by Ian Gray. Ms Harris, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking Claire Adamson for bringing this Members' de Business Debate on Child Safety Week to the Chamber this evening. As we've heard, Child Safety Week runs from the 3rd to the 9th of June. And it is with thanks to charities like the Child Accident Prevention Trust, who work tirelessly in their efforts to promote and raise awareness of the risks of child accidents and, more importantly, how these can be prevented. The theme of this year's Child Safety Week is Family's Life Today, Where's the Risk? And the aim is to highlight the new dangers facing families today from our modern and sometimes complex lifestyles. I have visited numerous nurseries in my capacity as party spokesperson for children and young people. And whilst these visits have not directly been in relation to child safety, it's always very evident the stringent rules that nurseries have in place and the standards to which they operate in order to prevent accidents in that environment. I'm sure that I'm not alone when I say that children should be free to lead active, healthy lives and they should be given every encouragement to experiment, play and take risks. Odd bumps and scrapes are all parts of growing up. They're how we learn about the world around us and as parents we accept this but there is a balance to be struck. Sadly, accidents involving children continue to devastate lives, with under fives particularly at risk. On average, half of the under fives attend accident and emergency every year, following an accident that could have been prevented. But it doesn't have to be like this. By getting down to our kids' level and seeing the world through their eyes, we can actually spot dangers and help keep them safe. Sadly, many neighbourhoods have seen the demise of the school um, crossing patrol, meaning that fewer primary school children are receiving pedestrian training. I firmly believe that road safety awareness is a crucial life-saving skill and all children should have pedestrian training. However, education is of course just one aspect of road safety. We as parents have a vital role to play in teaching our children the skills they need to stay safe. As I mentioned earlier, family life today is far more complex. It's certainly more complex than it was compared to 10 years ago, and it's often the very things that make life more convenient that bring new risks and new dangers. And by new dangers, I'm including things like dishwasher tablets and even laundry capsules. You know, they might sit innocently in a cupboard, but in their eye-catching packaging, it turns them into one of the things that appeals to a child's curiosity pretty to look at, but potentially deadly in the hands of a child. Probably one of today's biggest distractions around the home and indeed outside is the use of mobile phones. I'm sure we're all familiar with the age old saying that you need eyes in the back of your head when you have young children. The time it takes to be distracted by the reading of one single text is enough time for a child to run out onto a busy road or street or swallow that dishwasher tablet or indeed worse. But set aside the distractions of mobile phones, the reality is they are now part of everyday life. Sadly, however, they can come with a whole host of risks for our children. Roughly 35% of children in the age bracket 10 to 11 own a mobile phone. Children today are growing up in a completely different world and they face problems that I never had to face when I was younger. If you think your child won't be affected by, for example, sexting, well, the statistics would strongly disagree. According to a UK survey on teenage mobile phone habits, six out of 10 UK youths have been asked to send a sexual image or video of themselves. Shockingly, 25% of those asked actually did send an explicit image, or even more shocking, a third sent it to someone they knew online but not in real life. If I listed all of the dangers that our children are exposed to nowadays, both within and outside the home, I don't think if my own children were still young that I would have ever let them out my sight. But we have a duty to our children, a duty to let them be just that, children. To let them explore, let them learn, let them laugh and let them live. So thank you, President. Thank Officer. you very much. I call Ian Gray, we're followed by Mark Rusko. Mr Gray, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Claire Adamson for bringing this important issue uh, to the attention of the Chamber this evening. Presiding Officer, 
Um, it has been highlighted already just how devastating uh, an impact uh, childhood accidents can have upon children themselves, but also uh, their families and indeed communities across the country. Uh, and that it is the largest cause of childhood death in Scotland after the neonatal period, as the motion uh, tells us, <clears throat> should really give us pause for reflection uh, to consider if we are doing all that we can to reduce these kind uh, of incidents. The work done by the Child Accident Prevention Trust is of course vitally important in supporting parents and families to understand uh, and to help them navigate the risks of modern family life. So this week is a welcome opportunity to highlight the work that the, uh, many other organisations are doing uh, and indeed to highlight, as colleagues have done, the resources that they have created online and otherwise uh, for access by parents uh, and by families. Uh, accidents, of course, can happen to any family in any home. Parenting uh, is tough and, and difficult, a risk in itself, uh, whatever the family circumstances. And there are plenty of examples we can all think of, uh, of tragedy striking uh, the privileged and perhaps the the celebrity, but that cannot hide the fact uh, which Claire Adams drew our attention to that childhood accidents and by extension preventable hospital admissions in Scotland as elsewhere are socially patterned. If we look at the most recent statistics, we can see around a 30% difference between the most and least deprived areas for admission to hospital as a result of unintentional injury to children. And what's more with this, uh, as with uh, many other illnesses, conditions and reasons for hospital admission, there is a correlation, an exact gradient showing that no matter where you are uh, on the SIMD ladder, you are less likely to be admitted for an unintentional injury than those who live in an area more deprived than your own. And you're more likely to be admitted than those who live in an area, sorry, and more, you are more likely to be admitted than those who live in an area less deprived uh, than your own. The chances of suffering admission for an accident then is determined uh, significantly by your socioeconomic status. So the question is what can be done to reduce that inequality and indeed reduce the overall numbers of accidents which lead to admission and injury. How do we support uh, those more vulnerable families uh, to minimise uh, this disparity uh, in apparent risk to their children? And we do know some of what works because evidence this week from the Institute of Fiscal Studies uh, has shown that Sure Start centres in England, family centres situated in the most disadvantaged areas and designed to provide targeted uh, early years and learning uh, 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 for the whole family uh, have closed that hospitalisation gap for children between the most and least deprived areas by as much as half a very significant reduction. So such results in improving children's health and well-being just show us what can be achieved by addressing some of the wider issues uh, of in inequality uh, and vulnerability in the family generally. So as we reflect on this evening's debate and consider uh, what can be done to promote greater safety for children, we should certainly bear in mind uh, those results uh, from England uh, and the evidence that addressing some of the uh, inequalities of, uh, of, of income and wealth can make a difference too. Thank you very much. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Mark McDonnell. Mr. Ruskell, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I can also thank uh, Claire Adamson for her real leadership on child safety uh, issues in this parliament and also the, the excellent work of the Child Accident Prevention Trust that I've heard about um, in, in the CPG. Um, it, it is now a, a week, uh, one week almost, till the stage one debate on my restricted roads 20 mile an hour bill. So I would like to just comment on the importance of speed reduction in tackling child casualties in our communities. And, you know, as Claire was saying, there are many personal stories out there. But my personal story is that a classmate of mine uh, was run over and killed um, when I was at primary school, when he was out playing uh, on his bike. Um, this incident didn't happen uh, outside of the school. It happened in the residential street uh, where he lived. 
like four-fifths of the child casualties uh, that we have uh, on, on our roads. And obviously, you know, it was an unimaginable uh, impact on not just his uh, family, but also on the wider community through that, that death. Um, the, the first person to be killed in a motor accident was in 1896, and the coroner at the time said that such a thing would never happen again. He actually wrote those words in his report. And unfortunately, you know, we're now over 100 years on from that. We've seen over half a million deaths in the UK alone uh, through, through road accidents. So it's important that although things are getting better, that we continue to take action. And I do think that an important and central step um, to delivering safer streets is to get the speed limit right. Um, it is about infrastructure, as Gillian Martin's pointed out, but it's also about that first step of getting a safer speed limit. And not just outside of schools, but, but where people actually live, which is where my, my friend was killed. Um, a government policy on this is good. You know, 20 mile an hour is the norm. Uh, it's backed by the World Health Organization. It's backed by the OECD and the EU. But the reality is that at the moment, it's a real postcode lottery as to whether you live on a street which is 20 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour. If you live in the borders uh, and you're a child, you're likely to be uh, growing up on a 30 mile an hour road. If you live in Fife, you'll be on a 20 mile an hour street or Edinburgh. Now, the, the, the REC committee uh, published their report last week, and um, it's a report that certainly recognizes the benefits of 20 in terms of road safety uh, and the benefits in terms of promoting walking and cycling uh, as well. But one of the recommendations is that local councils should continue to choose not to introduce 20 mile an hour in their areas um, should, they, should they wish to. And I, I, I don't agree with that. I believe it's just going to perpetuate the kind of inconsistency uh, that we've already got in Scotland, which leaves some children uh, more vulnerable than others. Um, I would like to commend the work of Sustrans, who, who do some fantastic work uh, in this area of child safety. And they unfortunately weren't invited to give evidence to committee, but they did come out with a report a couple of weeks ago that showed that traffic incidents involving children are three times more likely to happen in deprived areas than more affluent areas. And there's a double injustice here um, because it's deprived communities are often locked out of the transport opportunities. You know, they're, they're the communities with poor bus services, car ownership is low, and yet they face higher risks um, purely just down to the postcode um, that, that they live in. And of course, we all know, we all know that, you know, through this kind of discretionary approach, it will always be the more affluent communities the well-organized communities with community councils who will be successfully lobbying for 20 mile an hour zones where the deprived communities will be, will be left behind. So in conclusion, presiding officer, um, you know, the evidence is there that 20 works. I mean, Fife, we saw a, a, a big reduction, 20% reduction in accidents as a result of Fife going completely 20. It was even higher, 32% reduction uh, in more deprived communities. So I, I really think now it's time for Scotland to join Wales, uh, and actually London as well, in declaring Scotland uh, as a 20-mile-an-hour as nation and ensuring that the default speed limit in those streets where we live, work, and play goes from 30 to 20 miles an hour. Thank you very much. I call Mark MacDonald to be followed by Bill Kidd. Mr MacDonald, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I, uh, too, congratulate Claire Adamson on securing this debate and would echo Mark Ruskell's comments that for a number of years now, uh, Ms Adamson has been uh, leading the way in relation to safety and accident prevention in this Parliament, and I hope that continues uh, to be the case. She mentioned uh, in her speech the issue around poisoning and one area which I noted in the Child Accident Prevention Trust information uh, and growing risk and emerging risk is around the liquid nicotine refills from e-cigarettes which uh, our hospitals are reporting growing numbers of children accidentally swallowing and ingesting liquid nicotine uh, from e-cigarette refills. So uh, that is an emerging risk which needs to be borne in mind in individuals and, and families where uh, those refills are, are to be found need to think very carefully about safe storage uh, of those. Uh, the other issue which Claire Adamson mentioned, she spoke about the, the issue of the, the cases that we, we talk about being the tip of the iceberg because uh, they, they are the ones which, which we see 
uh, measured in statistics. And it, that chimes with a, a report from um, within the journal, The Archives of, of Disease in Childhood. One of the co-authors was Dr. Jamie Cooper, a, a consultant in emergency medicine at the Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital, who said, uh, we only see the tip of the iceberg. We only see it when it is not uh, alleviated. And in that journal article, three uh, cases were highlighted uh, from within Aberdeen alone um, of children choking on eating after eating whole grapes. Um, unfortunately, in two of those instances, a five-year-old boy choked while eating grapes at an after-school club um, and had a heart attack and died. Uh, and a 17-month-old boy uh, choked while eating grapes with his family at home. And while the grape was eventually removed by paramedics, the little boy sadly still died. In the third instance, um, a two-year-old choked while snacking on grapes in the park suffered two seizures and spent five days in intensive care, but thankfully recovered. Now, those are only cases in Aberdeen. And um, within the report, it, well, if I could just finish this point, uh, within the report, it highlights that uh, grapes are the third most common cause of death in food-related incidents. And uh, my researcher wondered what the other two were, so she looked them up, and they are hot dogs uh, and sweets. Um, so I still cut my own children's grapes uh, before feeding them to them, and chances are I probably will until they're teenagers and tell me to stop doing it. Um, I'll take Claire Adamson's intervention. Claire Adams. Thank you very much for taking the intervention. Um, the Cross-Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness was um, delighted to have a presentation through the Mark Scott Leadership Awards um, from a group of schools in Cumbernauld who had taken inspiration from those very stories and had developed a training programme. They themselves became first aid trained and were then going out and teaching primary schools about the dangers of choking and um, get, giving their expertise on to, to younger groups of children. And I just wondered if the member would agree that um, that first aid awareness is really important and that people should take up opportunities to learn about it. Uh, uh, Mark McDonnell, uh, make up your time, yes. Well, I, I, I'm very grateful for that presenting officer. I, I, absolutely, and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later now that I've got that time back to be able to do so. Um, the other issue which was mentioned by Claire Adamson was drowning, and uh, members from the North East who are present in the chamber will perhaps remember uh, the tragic incident in 2016 where my constituent, Julie Walker, uh, died while trying to save her six-year-old son, Lucas, at Aberdeen Beach, who sadly also died. Uh, and that was the uh, incident which led to the formation of the Aberdeen Water Safety Group, bringing together various agencies in the city of Aberdeen to look at how water safety could be promoted, not just at the beach, but also uh, in relation to the two rivers uh, in Aberdeen uh, as well and some of the open water uh, that exists within the city. There's another uh, group which I want to highlight based in my constituency and that's Absafe, uh, an organisation which does a huge amount of work to improve safety awareness uh, within the city. Uh, they have a an interactive facility called The Safe uh, in Bridge of Dawn in my constituency where their team and volunteers deliver engaging fun and informative sessions that teach children about everyday hazards and how to deal with them, including road, railway, home, fire, safety, solvent misuse, antisocial behaviour, cyberbullying and security. Um, they're funded by Aberdeen City Council to ensure that every primary seven child in the city receives a complimentary day visit and their lessons follow the curriculum for excellence, ensuring the delivery is age appropriate, supports required learning outcomes and fits the GERFEC principles. And finally, presiding officer, uh, Claire Adamson mentioned first aid, and I absolutely agree that first aid training is important. It was great to see the announcement that all local authorities in Scotland will deliver CPR training in schools, but CPR training will only take you so far in relation to being able to save a life. Uh, for example, in a choking incident, for wider first aid training is perhaps necessary. I noted the first aid training call from St Andrew's First Aid through their petition to the Petitions Committee. I recognise the government have said this is a matter better dealt with by local authorities authorities on an individual basis. I hope perhaps we might see some leadership from COSLA and local authorities in relation to that and wider first aid training for children can be made available to ensure that they are equipped not just to spot hazards but also to deal with the situations they may face with their peers. Thank you. I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Whittle will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. And I uh, along with others, would like to share my appreciation of Claire Adamson for bringing the topic of Child Safety Week to the Chamber. Uh, by doing so, Claire provides us with the opportunity to highlight the impact that safety habits and accident prevention measures can have for families across Scotland. 
It's important that we continue to discuss child safety as there are new and unexpected hazards, as has been mentioned by others. And it uh, is it, worth saying again, actually, they're changing new unexpected hazards which people weren't aware of previously. But we need to learn about these things and we need to be aware in our modern world. The Child Accident Prevention Trust, who instigated Child Safety Week, say that as a result of accidents, over 2,000 children are admitted to hospital every week. Um, we can work to reduce this number by prompting consideration of some of the new dangers and hazards that children face. Accidents, of course, by their nature, are an unpleasant surprise, and the Child Action Prevention Trust um, are working to reduce this element of surprise by collating information about the causes of accidents and it provides tips on how to help parents consider these unexpected hazards. With this information, they have created a free guide for educators, child protectioners and other professionals to help them start conversations with parents about how to prevent the unexpected. In other words, the Trust has created free prompts for parents and practitioners to help them recognise hazards that they otherwise and understandably may not have been aware of. What underpins this debate and is also the context of and motivator for Child Safety Week is the deeply sad reality that uh, this, in, this um, information hasn't always been available to parents who have ended with losing children through accidents. Accidents are also the leading cause of death, serious injury and acquired disability for children and young people in the UK. And the reality of this uh, makes discussion of child safety extremely important. Alongside the Child Accident Prevention Trust, parents, teachers, child, pra child care practitioners and more, we are all motivated to start a Scotland-wide conversation about we, how we can minimise hazards and prevent accidents. Uh, I fully support Child Safety Week. I've written to all schools and nurseries within my constituency of Glasgow Anisland to encourage teachers and play workers uh, to use the free materials provided by the Child Accident Prevention Trust. And this is a conversation that needs to be inclusive. One in six parents have difficulty reading. So it's important the action packs activities are used to engage parents. This needs to be on everyone's radar so that children from across Scotland and from all backgrounds are safe. That can include practical demonstrations as well as leaflets. The Trust's action pack outlines simple and practical information covering hazards that can cause burns and scalds, a child to stop breathing, poisoning, falls, drowning. The pack also looks at tips on road safety and fire safety. It tells us that a baby's skin is 15 times thinner than an adult's. So babies can be badly burnt on hot things much more easily than an adult can. And young children also do not have the reflex to pull away from something that is burning them. Rather, this is something that is actually learnt. And the Trust points out an example um, of hazard of hot drinks, a cup of tea or coffee can scald a baby as much as 15 minutes after it's been made. This free pack is available to download from the Child Accident Prevention Trust website and it contains many helpful tips. It's easy to read and has activities that child practitioners can use to help engage parents in the conversation. And I encourage those working with children and in contact with parents to use the Trust free materials to participate in Child Safety Week 2019 and to start conversations about how we can increase children's safety. Thank you. Thank you. Can I gently remind members to use full names in the chamber? There's only been a few slip-ups in this uh, perfectly understandable, friendly uh, debate. Uh, um, Brian Whittle, then I move to the Minister. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I also add my uh, congratulations to Claire Adamson uh, for bringing this topic to the chamber and also commend the work that she continues to do uh, in this important field. And we all know uh, the well-known phrase that accident ha accidents happen, but I think what we're debating in here is that there's many cases where they don't have to happen and, uh, and, and there, are, there are simple precautions that can be taken to make the place safer for our children. I think the challenge of planning ahead, uh, as, as parents will, will, will tell us, trying to see accidents before they happen, I think that's something that we do uh, intuitively. Uh, a young child sees the world differently uh, from an adult, literally because they are smaller than us and figuratively because 
you may see a washing up uh, liquid capsule and they may see that as, as a sweetie. Now the phrase uh, children, uh, particularly young children who don't understand the dangers, rely on their parents and other adults to take responsibility and reduce risks is something I want to come back to uh, and focus on a bit later in my speech, if I could, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. But I think the importance of collaborative working, not only among organisations who run campaigns like Child Safety Week, but also between parents and families is important. Whether that's new parents sharing their experiences or getting the opportunity to share their experiences with other new parents or new grandparents sharing their memories and knowledge. I think even encouraging older children to think about what hazards there are and how they can help to protect their younger siblings at home. And I think speaking from experience, I'll support anything that reduces the risk of me stepping barefoot on a piece of Lego. I think education plays a, a huge role, whether formal education and guidance from the Scottish Government and other agencies or the anecdotal education we gain from speaking to other people and learning from their experiences. I think we've, learned, we've heard today about, about the dangers of modern uh, lifestyles, about more batteries and electronics and more devices using smaller button type ba uh, batteries, the, the washing up uh, uh, liquids, the colourful washing up liquid capsules, even things like blind uh, cords. And not all these are new dangers. I think choking hazards and poisonous liquids are nothing new, but many of the same basic rules uh, apply. I think it's not, uh, it's not a case here of wanting to take up that sort of nanny state approach. I think it's vital that we give children the space to learn awareness uh, of their environment. I think children will always hurt themselves at some point, and when they do, they learn how to avoid it happening again and how to deal with it. I think we're trying, what we're talking about here is building up a resilience, and I think we've got to be careful not to sanitise uh, their environment too much so they don't get that ability to learn. So it's important not just to eliminate hazards from around children, but to try and teach them why you're doing it. Uh, of what that hazard is and what it could do. So teaching our children to be aware of hazards is just as important as keeping hazards away from children. So if I could uh, go back to that, that, that uh, idea that, that uh, adults need to take responsibility uh, and reduce the risks for their children. I think there's a couple of meetings I had last week. One was with uh, Alcohol Focus Scotland. And one of the phrases they said to me that they'd, they'd been interviewing uh, children of, of, uh, uh, with parents who have an alcohol problem, and one of the things that, that, that resonated with me was the phrase that the children said, what, what, what they most wanted to happen was their parents not to drink when they're, while they're still up. So try and, try and uh, to, to take their alcohol once the, the children had gone to bed. And that, that resonates with us for so many different reasons. One of the things I thought, you know, I knew this debate was coming up, and wh why that resonated with me was we know that alcohol impairs our ability to, to, to focus on our environment, not, not just in terms of, uh, of the attention that we give to our children. But if, if, our, if our judgment is impaired, and that, this counts for, uh, obviously for, for drugs use as well, if our judgment is impaired, by definition then, the danger to children must, must increase. I think I was, I was down in Westminster yesterday with the, the Scottish Affairs Committee looking at the drug and alcohol problem within Scotland and, and deprivation uh, is, is an area where there are more issues around um, problem drug and alcohol use. So I think this is a much bigger and a much wider issue that we need to discuss. And, and, and as already been mentioned by, by, by Ian Gray, we need to focus our attention on that area, on, on that area and, on a much wider issue. We need to look at how we're dealing with the drug, the drug and alcohol issue. Uh, and, and in turn, that will improve the safety, I think, of the environment in which children uh, are involved. I would love to talk about this some more, Deputy President, because I realise my time's at an end, so I will leave it there. And again, thank Claire Anderson for bringing this. Thank you very much. You need to put down a parliamentary motion, a member's debate, or something like that, Mr. Riddle, if you want to expand on it. Uh, worthy. I call on Marie Todd to close the Government Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me um, begin by thanking Claire Adamson for bringing forward this really important motion. Um, maintaining the safety of our children is of the utmost importance, and the Scottish Government remains committed to this, as it does for improving safety for everyone right across Scotland. It's been great to hear the contributions um, from the members around the Chamber about all the innovative work going on, the length and breadth of Scotland to help children themselves to recognise risk, to help young people to spot hazards and to risk assess and to respond to accidents. And that work is going on from nurseries to schools to community groups. And that's really been a pleasure to hear this evening. 
The work led by Ms Adamson through the cross-party working group on accident prevention continues to address the important issues that contribute towards keeping safe and that crosses so many of our national outcomes and ambitions. And we've heard a whole variety of different angles here in the chamber, and that just shows you how cross-cutting this issue is. The safety of particular population groups, including children and older people, how we move about our communities, both on foot and by transport, and the key messages around staying safe in our homes. I want to commend the cross-party working group for their endeavours in this and for the range of partners involved, including the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, ROSBA, Scottish Community Safety Network, COSLA, Scottish Public Health Network, and the Scottish Business Resilience Centre. And of course, the Child Accident Prevention Trust, for whom this week the Scottish Government is once again delighted to support um, National Child Safety Week in Scotland. Now, the key to success in this area lies in working together to raise awareness about risks, to progress actions and initiatives that help to reduce incidents, importantly working with our communities to better understand the issues and to identify solutions. It's very clear from statistics as we've heard that sadly unintentional harm remains a major cause of death and injury amongst children and the under fives are disproportionately affected by unintentional harm. It's one of the leading causes of death in children under the age of 15 in Scotland. While we do want children to lead active healthy lives um, we do need to equip parents with the tools and information which will enable them to do, so safe, that, to do that safely. The tragic impact for parents of losing a child or with dealing with a life-changing injury just can't be underestimated. And I know that we're all in agreement across the chamber that one life lost is one too many. While it's clear that work still needs to be done to reduce these figures, we do know that the number of children admitted to hospital as a result of unintentional injuries has fallen steadily over the last decade from 8,000 353 in 2008-9 to 7,259 in 2017-18. The number of deaths due to unintentional injury among children has also fallen from a peak of 147 in the mid-1980s when I was a youngster to 16 in 2017. Now that's a really dramatic shift. The need to keep up this momentum though links directly into the importance of Child Safety Week. Since 2008, the Scottish Government has supported the Child Accident Prevention Trust to run this special week to help increase awareness and to inform parents about accident risks to children and the simple steps that can be taken to avoid those accidents. Earlier today, the Minister for Community Safety, Ash Denham, visited Smile Child Care Preschool Centre where she met childcare providers and parents and carers. And the event focused primarily on burns and scalds and poisonings. And I understand that everyone involved, including the families and practitioners, agreed it was useful and informative. I spent the morning myself in Clober Nursery in, in Mulgai um, with an incredibly innovative setting who were doing a lot of outdoor work involving STEM. The children were sewing and ha working with hammers and nails. Incredible work, but a lot of work had gone in to risk assess that to make sure that they could safely explore these things and safely um, follow the, where their curiosity took them. As Ms Adamson highlighted, this year's Child Safety Week, Family Life Today, Where's the Risk, is dedicated to raising awareness about the risks of everyday household items that have become a convenient part of modern living. So we know that the under fives suffer most injuries at home and this year's campaign highlights how, due to modern technology and other advances, home safety is much more complex than ever before and that makes it difficult for each generation. You can't, you know, there are still some of the same old hazards there but some of these are brand new hazards that just didn't exist before. So that distraction of the mobile devices, I'm as guilty as any parent for watching my phone when I should be watching my children the increased use of button batteries and those brightly coloured detergent liquid tabs all pose new risks to children's health and well-being that parents and carers might not have considered. It was really great to hear from Claire Adams and that manufacturers are responding to some of the concerns which have arisen and designing in risk mitigation and that's an important way of tackling this issue. I'm aware that over the week, a range of local activities are taking place right across the country, working with health visitors, community nursery nurses, 
Home Start groups, amongst others, to raise awareness of key accident hazards, together with practical prevention measures. Certainly. Maurice Corrie. Presiding officer, thank you. I thank the Minister for taking my intervention. In respect to drowning accidents, and I know you referred generally to that just now in Scotland, would the Minister agree with me that it is really very concerning indeed that 59% of local councils in Scotland do not have a water safety policy in, in either coastal or inland waters? Minister? Yeah, I, I would agree that that is concerning. I mean, I think that drowning accidents, um, I mean, I come from a, a small fishing village I grew up in. I represent the Highlands and Islands, which has a vast and beautiful coastline. We're well aware of the uh, risks of water nowadays, but these things do seem to keep occurring with um, devastating regularity and anything that we can do to tackle that. And I'm sure that drowning is preventable. Anything that we can do to tackle that should be done. The Scottish Government is delighted to endorse Child Safety Week's resource packs, which are available to community groups and services, providing ideas and information on how to prevent accidents. My congratulations to the Child Accident Prevention Trust for once again working so hard to raise awareness through this excellent week-long in initiative. Nationally, our policy policies, including GERFEC and the Baby Box programme, the Family Nurse Partnerships, all contribute to ensuring that our children lead healthy, happy and safe lives. And as a government, we continue to work with national and local partners to raise awareness of unintentional injuries and to improve outcomes for all the vulnerable groups. And that includes working with the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents this year. Um, they've done a great deal of work with the Building Safer Communities Executive Group on Unintentional Harm, chaired by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and that engages a whole range of partners. You know, we are going to solve this problem by working together. On Friday, that partnership is hosting its second national learning event for local practitioners, where over 100 delegates will come together to discuss and share local practice. And that event will also see the launch of an unintentional harm and injury website for local practitioners to share evidence, guidance and best practice examples from across Scotland. It's a fantastic tool that's been developed collectively and it'll be excellent to see that grow as a route to improving outcomes through learning and from all the great work that's underway across Scotland, adapting it to meet local need. I'd like to thank once again um, Claire Adamson for bringing this important issue to the Chamber and I'd like to commend again the Child Accident Prevention Trust and ROSPA for their truly excellent and continued work to support child safety across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you Minister. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>